I want to read you a, a really a, a remarkable statement that a remarkable man made in the book of Philippians. Uh, Paul said this, Brothers and sisters, I myself don't think I've reached it, and by it he means the finish line, the full completion of all that God wanted to do in his life. But I do this one thing. I forget about the things behind me, and I reach out for the things ahead of me. Wow, pretty good. Here's another way. This is what I do. I don't look back. I don't look back. Now, if anybody had a reason to make a statement like this, it was Paul. Because he was a former persecutor, abuser, tormentor, murderer. By the way, let's welcome Jim Winters to the front row. Jim, welcome. You have now entered the splash zone. Excellent. Excellent. They all come around in the end. If anybody had a reason for not looking back, it was Paul. He had so much behind him that he needed to forget. In fact, this is a pretty good rule for life and living. It's not a really good idea to look back. In fact, Jesus, uh, he really said it best with three little words. Probably, this is the second shortest verse in the entire Bible. Three words. Remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife looked back as God was trying to deliver her in his mercy out of a situation. And you say, Pastor Buddy, why did she look back? Not out of curiosity. She looked back because what was, she loved what was behind her more than she loved what was in front of her. You will never come out of anything when you love that more than what God wants to bring you into. You will always look back. And she looked back because it is said that Lot's wife was probably a sodomite. She was from the family and had relatives in Sodom. This was her home. This was her city. And she didn't really have a problem with all of the things that were going on in Sodom. She thought it was a place, a good place to raise her kids. Didn't have a problem. God said, I need to get you out of here before this destroys you. Aren't you glad God does that? In his mercy, he brought them out so that it would not destroy them. But because she loved what was behind her more than the promise of God in front of her, she looked back and became Sodom chloride, as it were. In the Old Testament, the people of God, just as they were getting ready to enter into their inheritance, just as they were getting ready to enter in, They made a fatal error. They looked back. They saw their inheritance, and all they saw were walled cities and big people and giants and all kinds of problems and challenges ahead of them, even though that was God's inheritance for them. That was God's way for them. And they looked back because here's what happens. Oftentimes, when we're getting ready to step into something that God has for us, the enemy loves nothing more to turn the light out on what God has for us and turn the light on to what we've come out of to cause us to look back. And they began to remember Egypt. They began to remember. They didn't remember all the bad stuff. They only remembered the good stuff. We remember the vegetables. We remember when we had real food. We remembered this. We remember that. They ended up losing their inheritance because they were looking back. And so the general rule is that I think every one of us ought to have is this. It's not a good idea to look back. Just simply not a good idea to look back. But how many of you know that with every rule there are exceptions? Now, if you've studied English, you know this is true. English is one of the most difficult languages in the world to learn. Uh, especially uh, when you compare it to something like Spanish. 
Because in Spanish, you have five vowels, and they always sound the same all the time. A, A, E, O, U. That's, that's the way they sound, right? Isn't that right? Come on. They, they don't change. They're always A, A, E, O, U, right? In English, huh, they can sound, you know, you have rough, and you have tough, and you have cough, and you have bow, and you have through, and, you know, right? It's a big deal. And so when your English teacher, grammar teacher, and vocabulary teacher says, here is the rule. Here is the rule. I before E. I before E. So if you're going to spell relieve, I then E. If you're going to spell believe, I then E. And so just about the time you get it down. Okay, I before E, the teacher says, except after C. You hear all this murmuring, Lord? This is the, what English does to you. An exception, because if you're going to spell receive or perceive, it's the other way around. And so it is with God. The general rule is, don't look back. Period. Just don't. But then God comes along and says, oh, by the way, I have some exceptions for you. Some exciting exceptions. There were actually three times in the Word when God gave people permission to look back. He wanted them to look back. And this was an amazing thing, three different times in the Word. And I want to give you these three times today because I believe it will help you, and I know it's helping me, to do life the way God intends for us to do it. You ready? All right, here we go. Here's the first one. The first time God ever told people they could look back was in Exodus chapter 14. Here it is. When all the Israelites had reached the other side, the other side of what? The Red Sea. The Lord said to Moses, raise your hand over the sea again, then the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and their chariots and charioteers. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea. And the water rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. Then the waters returned and covered all the chariots and charioteers, the entire army of Pharaoh. Of all the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites, notice that, chased the Israelites into the sea, not a single one survived. This is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Number one, the first place, the seashore. They were standing on the seashore. Now, you got to understand, God said to them, when you leave Egypt, I do not want you to look back. I want you to head straight out and keep going forward. And you keep your eye on the rod. Moses is going to have the rod up. You keep your eye on the rod. I'm going to give you a cloud. It's going to have a pillar of fire, and it's going to have smoke. I want you to keep your eye on that. And whatever you do, just keep moving forward. And so they began to move. Now, knowing God and knowing what he does, God never just does things straight forward, huh? Are we serving the same God? (laughs) It's a long and winding road with God. The Bible says he did not take them out the short way. He took them out the long way. So they started going out. Then they made a little turn over here. And then they made a little turn over here. Turn over here and turn over here. And they kept following the cloud. Now, they began to hear some noise coming from behind them. uh, And it began to distract them. And so the Bible says they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. Well, the only way you can see Egyptians overtaking you is if you are looking back. So they started looking back. God said to Moses, tell the people to go forward. He opens the sea. They walk through this massive wall of water. They get to the other side. 
Mind you, God has all along said, you keep going forward. Whatever you do, don't look back. Keep looking forward. They got all the way on the other side. And then all of a sudden, God stops the cloud right on the other side of the Red Sea. And they're all jammed up there right at the edge on the seashore of the Red Sea. And then it says this. And God waited until daybreak to begin to crush the enemy. Why? So they could see it. God wanted them to be able to see that everything that was chasing them was going to be destroyed. Because you see, when you come out of something, there's always something that tries to chase you. And try to stick with you. God said, I want you to get it settled right here on the seashore. I want you to see everything that was back there. Who you were. What you did. All of that. All the guilt. All the shame. All the failure. All the flaws. All of that stuff. I want you to see all of that stuff drowned in the sea. Under the waters of my mercy and my love and my forgiveness. It's all being crushed. And I want you to see it. I want you to receive it. I want you to get it. I want you to understand it. I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to doubt it. I want you to know it and get it in here. And so they saw it. The Bible says, and they saw the Egyptians drowned. God wanted them to turn around and see that. Because he said to them, you're not ever going back there again. That take one good look. Everything that was is now drowned. You turn around now and enter into your inheritance. I want to thank God today that Jesus Christ allows me to be able to turn around and look at all the junk that was behind me and see it drowned in the sea. Come on, there's an experience at the seashore that is absolutely incredible. If Jesus Christ is my Lord, I can look back and see God drowning everything That's been crushed by the power of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's all been crushed and drowned. So then what do they do then? They celebrate it. I mean, that's what you do, right? When you realize that God has given you a brand new life and that there nothing from the old has come out and you're all brand new. They started celebrating and they started dancing and they started having a great time. Because they understood. I think this is why some people don't celebrate. Because they don't realize what's been drowned. You see, all of that stuff. The enemy tries to tell me it's still alive. It's not alive. It's been crushed. It's drowned. It's over. All of my sin and all of that junk has been crushed and drowned by the goodness of God. This first one was by the seashore. The second one is also found in the book of Exodus. It's in Exodus 33. This one happened on the rock. This is Moses having a conversation with God, which are always interesting things. In Exodus 33, it says this, the Lord replied, because Moses has just asked God, I want to see your glory and your goodness. And this is what the Lord said to him. I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will call out my name, Yahweh. Before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose. Aren't you delighted that he does that? And I will show compassion to anyone I choose. Even if you don't think they deserve it, God says, I'll do it anyway. But look at this. But you may not look directly at my face. For no one may see me and live. What's God telling him? Look, I don't want to kill you. If I show you all of this, it's going to kill you. And we're going to have another Enoch on our hands. You're just going to have to come live with me. Right? God said, no, I don't, I don't want that to happen. So here's what he says. The Lord continued, look, stand near me on this rock. As my glorious presence passes by, I will hide you. In the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Listen to what God said. I've got you covered until I pass by. Right? Then I will remove my hand and I will let you see me 
from behind. Oh. But my face will not be seen. Do I have another one? No, I don't have another one. Consider this. Moses said, I want to see your glory and I want to see your goodness. You know, there's a difference between those two. The glory of God is his, who he is. It's his marvelous ways and excellent greatness. But his goodness is a little different. It's what he does. His goodness is how God takes anything that is not good and causes it to be good. That's his goodness. Moses said, I want to see your goodness. So God said, now, if you're going to see my goodness, you have to do it a certain way. Because you cannot look until I tell you. Because if you look too soon, you won't see it. So God says, you cannot look at the front of it. Because how many of you know, when you enter into something, initially, it probably may not look very good. And God said, you cannot look at it in the middle of it. Because when you're in the middle of adversity, the middle of the storm, the middle of the crisis, the middle of the, middle of the trauma, whatever it is, it's very difficult to see the goodness of God. But God says here, wait until I tell you to look and I will cover you. And then when I have totally passed by and done my work, then I will tell you when to look. And when you look, you will see my goodness. I'm going to amen that. Fifty years ago. Fifty years ago this month. Possibly 50 years ago this week. I found out that my father was leaving our family. Fifty years ago. That's a lot for a 12-year-old kid. That was not good. There was nothing good about that at all. But there was something I didn't know. I didn't know I had an appointment with Jesus. But the appointment was not in Florida where I lived. The appointment was in Texas. I didn't know that. Because God loves Texas. And basically said, look, if you're going to walk with me, you're going to have to come to Texas because I'm not going to Florida. I didn't know that. The only thing I knew about Jesus was what I sang. I went to church every Sunday as a kid. The only thing I ever knew about Jesus was he's a guy that did a lot of great things. And we used to sing a lot of Christmas carols and, at Christmas. And, and um, basically, I grew up uh, lay, uh, sitting on the front row uh, of the Methodist church. And when the preacher got up, I put my head in my mom's lap, lay out on the pew, and I'd get the best 30-minute nap ever. Seriously. In fact, the pastor used to love it. He used to tell my parents, he said, you know, if your son is not there sleeping, he said, it's hard for me to preach. Methodist sermons will do that. I don't know, maybe others too. But. I did not know that I had an appointment with Jesus. And just about the time I got to Texas, there was the cutest little blonde girl. It was in middle school that moved here. You know why she moved here? Because God knew that I couldn't live without her. And he brought her to Texas. I left a 4,000 square foot house to live in a 1,200 square foot house. 
I left a private school for a public school. I left a school of 85 kids to go to a school of over 1,000. I left a school where I knew everyone to go to a school where I knew no one. I left my best friend who lived across the street to come where I had no friends at all. That's hard for a 12-year-old kid. Traumatic. All of the moorings and tetherings and foundations and whatever were pretty much pulled out from under me in a week. But God. You see, God says, I meant that for good. Now, think about this. When people hear that, sometimes they think God's saying, well, man, I tried. I I meant well. You know, I I was really trying to do right. I was trying to make it okay. That's not what he means. When he says, I meant it for good, he means I have purposed it and willed it out of myself and for myself that it will be good for you. No bones about it. No ifs, ands, or buts. It will be good. And after years in my adulthood, when God rescued me from my own bitterness, my own hurt, my own pain, my own confusion... And all of that trauma in my adulthood, one day, he said to me, you can look now. And I turned around. And he had made it good. God said, listen. I got you covered until I pass by. Don't you worry. You wait for my goodness to do its perfect work. You see, God was not waiting to do something in my situation. He was waiting to do something in me. And once he has done his perfect work in me, then I can see his goodness behind me and not until. The rock is a special place. God said, go ahead, look behind you. There is nothing to fear. Everything, all things working together for good. If someone were to say to me today, God's a fraud. I'd still worship him anyway for all the amazing things that he's done in my life. The seashore, the rock. The third one, the throne. Here it is. John is seeing the future. Revelation 21, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, that's God saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne, said, Look, I'm making everything new. This is an amazing vision, really, 
revelation that John gets. He, he's been given the opportunity to see the throne. He sees all of these people who are the redeemed of God. These are all the people who have served Jesus and given their lives to Jesus. They are now standing before the throne. But some of them, many of them, are crying. You say, Pastor Buddy, how can they be crying when they're already in heaven? They're crying. I think one of the reasons why people are, will cry when they stand before God is they're going to realize how much they underestimated His awesomeness. I can't believe you're that great. I can't believe you're that glorious. I just never, never pictured it. I believe people are going to be weeping because they so underestimated how awesome He is. I think people are going to be weeping before the throne because of all the stuff that doesn't make sense, that they don't have any answers for, that they brought with them. And God turns around and He says, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look. Because the Bible says He opens the skies like a scroll. And when He does that, Everybody that is standing before the throne now sees exactly what God sees. Not from down here, but up there. They see the tapestry, not from the back, but from the front. They know as God knows, not as they once knew. Paul said, I one day will know as I am known. I will know what God knows that I do not know down here. And all of those people standing in front of the throne get a direction from God. God, turn around and look. I want you to look back down through history, through your destiny, through your life, through the events, the circumstances, the situations. I want you to take all of that in and look at it because now they know what God knows. And they know that it all fits. It all makes sense. It was all good. It was all right. Every loss has been accounted for. Every sacrifice has been rewarded. Every Everything that has been done has been resolved. The books have been balanced. Everything makes sense. It's all over. It's done. It's finished. Because they were allowed to look back to see it. And I want to tell you, there's some stuff that just doesn't make sense. My wife and I have walked through some things in the last four or five months. Make absolutely no sense. Other than the fact that Jesus is on his throne. And that one day, one day, regardless of what your enemy may say, one day I'm going to stand on that throne and I'm going to look as he looks. I'm going to see as he sees. I'm going to know as he knows. And I'm going to see that every accusation that was railed against God was fruitless and worthless and faithless because everything he did was good. Everything that he put together fit together. It makes sense. It was right and good. All down the line, everything fits. And that's when we're going to celebrate and thank Jesus because everything is in order. It's in place. It's as it should be for eternity. And that will be the last time that anybody ever looks back ever. Never again. Wow. It all makes sense. One day. The hosts of heaven, the redeemed, are going to hear him say, I make all things new. Now turn around. Amazing. The seashore, the rock, the throne. Looking back. It's not really very healthy. Just remember this. God's put your face forward so you will face forward. Right? That's the rule. But every once in a while, He gives us an opportunity to look back. Because it's good. And it's who He is. Let's pray. Father, we are amazingly grateful to you that you would even consider 
us. Much less that you would empty heaven for us. That you would send Jesus for us. That you would send your Holy Spirit. That you would empower us. That you would redeem us. We stand amazed. Because nothing of any of this is deserved. But you show mercy to whom you choose. You show compassion to whom you choose. And you have ordered my life. And while I would have gladly traded some very significant circumstances and events and situations in my life for something other than that. You are the God. You're the God who means it for good.